Hey everyone, this is uh, Ahmed Farag. I'm one of the ESIR residents at the University of Kentucky and one of the co-chairs for the Communications Committee. We uh, help run these webinars. Today we have a uh, great presentation by Dr. Hamelman. Um, the organizer, Chin Lee, is going to uh, take the show from here. Chin, it's all yours. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Chen, I'm one of the uh, residents at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I have uh, Dr. Benjamin Hamilton here to give us a talk on intercostal nerve blocks. Uh, you know, it's just one of the topics people don't really think about when you think about IR. You know, usually it's interventional oncology or some kind of vascular work, but I think uh, this can show, uh, you know, the breadth and depth of uh, IR procedures we do here and then the kind of clinical service can provide for the patients. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Dr. Hamilton take over. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Shin. Thank you, Ahmad. I, I really appreciate that introduction, and I appreciate uh, this opportunity. This is a, it is kind of a fun topic. I mean, there's a lot that we can do as interventional radiologists within the uh, world of pain management. There's a lot of our services that are underutilized. There's obviously a lot of competition for these procedures. Um, and, you know, I also didn't really get into interventional radiology wanting to become a, a pain specialist, and I'm not a pain specialist by any stretch of the imagination, but I've been lucky enough, I would actually say that this, these are some of the more gratifying procedures that I've been lucky to do because, you know, pain is frankly just painful. It really affects the quality of life and these can be very uh, gratifying procedures. Uh, just really quickly, I really don't have much as far as disclosures. I've done small amounts of consulting for those companies. Uh, those companies do make ablation, uh, some of them do make ablation machines that you could use, uh, you know, to do these procedures, but I'm not going to be talking about specific uh, systems very much at all. Uh, we will be talking about some off-label use of devices and drugs. So just more broadly, you know, we're here to talk about uh, intercostal nerve blocks. Uh, what are nerve blocks? Uh, what are we talking about? So there's actually more procedures that fall under this umbrella than you might uh, first think about. Anytime that we are blocking the signal processing through peripheral nerves, peripheral uh, nerve plexuses, uh, visceral nerve plexuses, um, through any chemical alteration or we're intentionally injuring the nerve to stop it from doing its job, essentially to stop pain from being transmitted, uh, this is a nerve block. Um, you know, we sometimes do this to individual nerves. We frequently will target nerve plexuses, uh, both somatic and visceral for different reasons. We almost always do it to mitigate pain, acute or chronic pain, but we can also do it to treat tremors, you know, unwanted muscle tremors. Uh, the idea here is that we're going to decrease the requirement for systemic medication, especially opiates. We're also going to vastly, hopefully, uh, improve that patient's uh, quality of life. And you know, different nerve blocks uh, can, depending on the depending on the agent we use, depending on the modality we use, we can either target temporary uh, a temporary effect or a longer lasting, more permanent effect. Um, there's so many different nerve blocks out there. What are the common nerve blocks that you might be more familiar with? If you are a medical student, uh, intern, you spend some time in the ER, you may have seen a digital nerve block or two as somebody puts stitches uh, in somebody's hand or somebody's finger. Um, epidural anesthesia uh, for surgery or for women in labor is a common use of a nerve block, a different type of nerve block. Uh, Post-operative nerve blocks are becoming more common. Uh, so uh, the most common uh, example of this is the femoral nerve block for knee replacement, uh, being able to decrease the amount of post-operative pain that we do there. Uh, I've done many celiac nerve blocks for visceral uh, uh, pain in patients who have abdominal and pelvic pain due to abdominal and pelvic tumors, uh, nerve facet blocks. Um, and if, you know, if we do it temporarily, we just call it a facet block. If we do it with a little bit of more permanent duration, we call it a rhizotomy. Uh, this phenopalatin ganglion block uh, has been used to treat chronic migraines. That's been getting a lot of uh, due press as of late. Uh, many you know, trigeminal neuralgia, you can do a, a trigeminal ganglion block. There are many different types of like facial nerve blocks. You know, any Botox injection is in some effects like a more permanent, long-lasting uh, nerve block. So nerve blocks are all around us in medicine. Um, and we use different agents in order to kind of select how long we want the duration to be. So if we're doing a short-term block, if we're treating some short-term post-operative acute pain, or we just want a temporary effect to 
uh, maybe even for a diagnostic purpose. We want to know, is this nerve, is this nerve block, is what I'm doing going to benefit the patient before I do something more permanent? We might use any number of uh, short-acting agents. You all have used lidocaine. You all have used it subcutaneously where it creates a little numb area. If you inject lidocaine around a peripheral nerve, it can actually deaden the entire area where that nerve uh, has its effect. Uh, bupivacaine and ropivacaine do similar things. They last a little bit longer. They can last anywhere from uh, you know, 12 to 24 hours, depending kind of on the local environments. And there's new and increased use of uh, botulinum toxins to have uh, similar effects as well. Many times though, we're looking at doing a longer term, uh, having a longer term intervention. So we're dealing with patients who have chronic pain issues. We're dealing with patients uh, who have palliative pain issues, uh, pain from cancer. And so we're trying to do a, a neurolysis. There are really two main ways to tackle this. You can either tackle it pharmacologically, most commonly with either alcohol or phenol, or you can tackle it with some type of thermal ablation. So you can either cook the tissue, including the nerve, to death, cause a, causing a permanent scar, or you can freeze it to death. And we'll talk a little bit more about the modalities that we can use to do that. But first, let's look at the anatomy a little bit here and talk about intercostal nerve blocks specifically. Why would we want to do an intercostal nerve block? So the intercostal nerves run intercostal. They run between the ribs, except for the one that runs underneath the 12th rib, that's the subcostal nerve. Um, and it gives off multiple branches that give rise to uh, cutaneous nerves and nerves that innervate the thoracic and abdominal wall. So to review, and I hope everybody can see my arrow, the you know, posterior ner nerve roots are the sensory nerve roots, the anterior ones are the motor ones, and then comes and joins at the ramus and uh, gives off a posterior division and this anterior division, this right here is the root or the origin of the intercostal nerve. And as it continues laterally, it gives off the lateral cutaneous branch, which innervates the skin laterally, and then anteriorly gives off the anterior cutaneous branch, and also has shorter branches that innervate the intercostal muscles and the thoracic and lower down the abdominal wall throughout. So this is the nerve that we're having uh, you know, effect on. And this right here, this nice red X, is where we're targeting to perform this uh, intercostal nerve block. And I think as you can see, if we do this, if we block all of the nerve signals coming through here, we're going to prevent pain from a strip uh, that surrounds the abdomen or thorax. And we also will affect some uh, muscles, specifically the intercostal muscles. But most patients, you know, taking out one, taking out three intercostal nerves will really not notice any effect of losing that intercostal muscle, uh, that, those intercostal muscle um, activity. Uh, why, given that anatomy, why do we do intercostal nerve blocks? There are really kind of like four uh, main th reasons that we get consulted to do this. Uh, one, and this one's kind of relatively new and more interesting, is uh, trauma. So patients who have gone through chest trauma, multiple rib fractures, they may have you know, acute pain for a number of days, weeks, um, or maybe they have a chest tube, or maybe they have a percutaneous biliary drain in. Uh, you can do intercostal nerve blocks to deaden the nerves that are affected uh, by any acute trauma, iatrogenic or otherwise. Um, this is not something that I have done much, but it is definitely a very interesting way to expand this field. Um, you know, just as an added point, if you decrease splinting, not only are you decreasing the opiate or pain requirement for these patients, but you decrease splinting, there's a decent chance you can improve ventilation and perfusion in these patients and, uh, you know, avoid having to intubate them. Um, there's another uh, etiology called uh, post-thoracotomy syndrome, which is, is interesting. Um, obviously, you can have acute or subacute pain from a thoracotomy or abdominal wall resection, but there are a number of patients, and it's not unrare for them to have a delayed pain set in uh, weeks or even months after a thoracotomy, especially, or an abdominal wall resection, and this would become a chronic pain issue. Um, it doesn't necessarily 
mean there's any acute inflammation going on. I think this is not a very well understood etiology, but these patients can have significant chronic pain, and I'll show you an example a little bit later here in this talk. Um, unfortunately, uh, working at big academic centers, we do see a lot of these cancer patients who have large chest wall or abdominal wall tumors and come to us with chronic pain issues, really looking for palliation and to improve the quality of their remaining lives. Um, and another interesting one, which I have never been referred to, and I fear that most of these end up in the pain management clinics, but post-herpetic neuralgia, um, the uh, reactivation of the herpes zoster virus causing permanent issues within the uh, peripheral nerves can cause pain within a specific dermatome or two, and this is something that can be mitigated with intercostal nerve blocks. Um, you know, we're going to be talking to patients about uh, potentially doing this procedure. What are the alternatives? You know, we talked a little bit about long-acting opiates. Uh, you know, that that's kind of self-evident. You can put them on longer and higher doses of pain medication, longer, you know, anti-inflammatories, um, anti-inflammatory medications and see if we're going to have a positive effect. But we're trying to get away from opiates as much as possible. Epidural steroid injections certainly can have uh, an effect, although probably not one as durable or as targeted. Uh, nerve stimulators are somewhat the realm of the pain management people. I'm less familiar, but can have some benefit here. Uh, intrathecal pain pumps, this is kind of, especially in our oncology patients, one of the last gasp uh, things that we can use, um, but can be very effective to implant a catheter into the intrathecal space and attach it to a pain pump that is managed by, uh, by pain medicine. Um, I was going to create a slide about the opiate crisis. I am uh, calling all y'all from, uh, you know, from South Philly. Uh, I, all I really need to say about this, I think you all know, the opiate crisis is is very very real. The large wave, uh, you know, the multiple waves of the worsening opiate crisis over the last five to ten years. A lot of this has been pushed by, uh, has been driven by prescriber. Uh, prescriber opiates that end up uh, on the street. And so as much as we can decrease opiates, um, I certainly have uh, nurses um, who I work with who have very personal stories about how this crisis has affected them. Um, this, is, this is a very personal uh, issue for a lot of us and uh, the opiate crisis is very real. And so we're trying to create here, offer an interventional alternative to systemic pain meds. Why us though? So why interventional radiologists? Why not the pain medicine people? Why not the surgeons? Why not uh, any other clinician? Um, I would like to I would like to support the idea that we don't need to cede this space to anesthesia and pain medicine. Uh, we have a lot of the expertise here. We have the expertise both in terms of the imaging guidance, the anatomy that we're looking for underneath that imaging guidance, and we also have the biggest familiarity with a lot of the tools, especially a lot of the tools uh, for ablation. And so we really are in a position to be active uh, in this space. Um, we also have familiarity with the surgeons and the oncologists who are going to be referring a lot of these patients to us. Um, I go to a handful of tumor boards and I spend a lot of time there talking about how I can treat tumor. And towards the end of the conversations, I always frequently need to mention that if this patient is having significant pain from what we're reviewing, there might be ways that I can mitigate that. And that's usually something that is, is something that the oncologists uh, are sometimes not thinking about at the forefront of their, of their minds. Uh, also, we're in a position, especially in, uh, well, in any hospital, to educate the house staff or hospitalists who are taking care of the patients overnight. Absolutely appropriate to increase a patient who's chronic pain, increase their pain medicine, but we have the opportunity to educate them and introduce the idea that a patient who has chronic pain, in this case, thoracic or abdominal, uh, you know, pain of the thoracic wall or abdominal wall, we're in a position to educate these people that there's something else that could be done. Let's uh, look really quickly uh, to where this intercostal nerve lives and talk about what we're going to be doing in terms of the procedure. Um, so we know, I think all of you have done a thoracentesis or have read about how to do a thoracentesis at some point in time, and we learned that the vein, artery, and nerve that run in between the ribs live right underneath the ribs. So they live right in this subcostal groove. And we've been taught when you do thoracentesis to basically hit the rib with your needle and then go immediately above 
that rib. And that allows us to avoid the artery especially, and hopefully to avoid any vascular complication. We're going to do something different here. We're actually targeting our needle or our ablation probe, whatever it may be, basically right at that neurovascular bundle. And so that definitely changes some of the risk profile and it just changes uh, what we're doing based on the anatomy. And sometimes there are clear, far, clear imaging findings that explain to us where we should be targeting. Sometimes there's a, a rib that's being destroyed by a lesion. But especially in the chronic pain patients, the patients with herpetic neuralgia, we really are relying on the work that's already been done to elucidate these dermatomes as to which nerve is the one that's going to be uh, the one that we need to target. And frequently, in pain medicine, there are many different uh, schools of thought. I tend to be, especially when it comes to interventional pain management, I tend to be a more is more type person. And so if if I decide that the, you know, the target dermatome is T9, there's a good chance I'm going to treat T8 and T10 as well. Uh, not everybody would do that, but it really depends on the clinical scenario, clinical patients. We rely on these dermatomes, though, to determine if we're targeting uh, the correct uh, thoracic nerve. We can always, of course, do a diagnostic injection. So inject a little lidocaine, a little bupivacaine, and see if it really does improve their pain before we do anything more permanent. Um, I always have to refer to this chart. This chart is hanging in my office. Uh, I use it more commonly for doing uh, spinal epidurals than anything else, but I always do try to remember that T4 or 5 typically is where the nipples are. T10 is where the umbilicus is, and then I can kind of quickly have that conversation with the patients when they're in clinic and figure out what level I think it is that I need to be targeting. Uh, we do need to talk about uh, the complications that can happen from these procedures. We've already talked a little bit about the alternatives. We're going to talk later about what we hope the benefits are. But when we're consenting patients to this, we need to fully inform them of the risks that can happen. Uh, clearly, one of the biggest risks is a pneumothorax. We, as interventionalists, are familiar with placing a needle directly into the lung on purpose to do lung biopsies. So we do this all the time. And we're pretty good at managing uh, a pneumothorax. We're pretty good at uh, putting a chest tube in when we rarely have to, and we're pretty good at managing the smaller pneumothoraces so that in an, in an expectant manner, so that uh, you know the, the small stable pneumothorax will probably resolve on its own. Uh, my particular standard for this is to get a chest X-ray two to three hours after the procedure. Uh, if there's already a small pneumothorax growing at the end of my procedure, I may get a chest X-ray right at the end of the procedure so I have something to compare it to two to three hours later. Um, but it's usually this two hour uh, post chest X-ray that's really gonna make me confident that I'm not sending a patient home uh, with, a, with a pneumothorax that's gonna be symptomatic. Um, also, the risk of excessive bleeding, right? So we could cause a hemothorax. That is a more difficult thing to manage. We are aiming right in the region of that neurovascular bundle, so it's important uh, that we are aware of this risk. We might see this on the chest x-ray two hours later. We also need to tell the patient, especially when we're just doing a small, you know, temporary nerve block, that there's some risk that we could cause a nerve sheath hematoma. A nerve sheath hematoma can cause long-term pain, paresthesias, tingling, and can really be bothersome um, in that area. So we may, you know, even make the, the situation worse, not better, although that risk is fairly small. Um, when it comes to bleeding risk, uh, all of you at this level should just start to become familiar with some of the consensus guidelines uh, that are available to us. And there's an excellent consensus guideline that the, the SIR uh, put out, I think, first in 2012 and then updated in uh, 2019. And what this is, is this is a document that basically uh, they you know, sat down with uh, CIRCE and the Canadian IR organization and came up with consensus guidelines on how to manage uh, bleeding risk. Uh, the way that they actually set this out it was they divided procedures into low-risk procedures and high-risk procedures. So low-risk procedures are you know, simply where the bleeding risk is lower and higher-risk procedures are where it's higher. And there are multiple factors that go into determining if something's gonna be low-risk versus high-risk. This procedure, I would argue, can be either. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the intercostal artery where it lives is not something that we can compress easily. So if bleeding does start and it doesn't quickly stop, it's not 
easy for me to put a finger there and push on the artery to stop the bleeding. This is different than when I do a femoral puncture, when I do a radial puncture, this is different from a peripheral uh, dialysis access bleed. Any of those locations, I can put my hand and I can try to control the bleeding, but I can't do that very easily in the intercostal artery. That being said, thoracentesis, which is really not that much different than what we're doing here, is considered a low-risk procedure. And so I would argue that when we're using just a small needle to deliver a pharmacologic uh, intervention to do this nerve block, this is probably a low-risk procedure. The low-risk procedures in this consensus document, uh, we can let the INR flow up to two. We can let the platelets come down to 20,000. We don't actually, in patients who aren't on anticoagulants, don't have anything active going on that makes me concerned, like renal failure for their bleeding status, I don't even have to check their INR platelets. Um, I also don't need to be afraid of single agent aspirin or Plavix necessarily. Every patient is different. This is just a consensus guideline. If you're extra worried about a patient, be extra cautious. But I would argue with small needles, this is likely a low risk procedure. On the other hand, I would argue with larger probes, this becomes a high-risk procedure. And this mirrors the fact that if you put a chest tube in a patient uh, going through, the, you know, going through the, uh, you know, the rib space, this becomes a high-risk procedure. And so our INR cutoff becomes more strict at 1.5, our platelet cutoff becomes more strict up at 50, and much more likely that I'm going to ask to hold Plavix for five days in that patient. Uh, also, hypertension control, I, you know, my personal practice, I'm probably going to want that systolic below 180. Different people will have different uh, MAP cutoffs, et cetera. You know, these patients come in with chronic pain, a lot of issues going on. Hypertension is not one of their number one, pri not one of their top medical priorities. They're going to have some white coat syndrome and they're going to be nervous from the procedure we're about to do. So plenty of these patients are hypertensive before uh before anesthesia, and we really need to make sure their blood pressure is under control before we do this procedure. Uh, there is certainly an infection risk to doing this procedure, although it's a very small one. Um, I argue with just doing a simple needle pharmacologic nerve block, the infection risk is extreme, extremely low. When you do an ablation, and there, there is, I should again say, a consensus uh, article that the SIR put out and updated in 2018 regarding this. Um, again, good one to have easy, quickly referenced. Uh, what they said about ablations, and I agree with, is simply that small ablations have a very low infection risk. And if it's a small, simple ablation that's, you know, doesn't have any complex factors that would increase the risk for infection, there really is no reason to use prophylactic antibiotics in these patients. And I would agree that's the case with this as well. But you should recognize that when you do an ablation, you are creating a small pocket of dead tissue that would love to get infected by any bacteria that came from the skin flora that you just went through that wasn't completely sterilized. And so if you, again, are at high concern, you might want to add a prophylactic antibiotic, usually just a one-time dose, usually something to cover and uh, usually something to cover gram positives. ANSEF is exceedingly popular in patients who do not have a severe pen allergy. Uh, and so plenty of practitioners do this. All right. We also need to be aware of pharmacologic complications, especially when we're doing a pharmacologic block. So if we're doing short-term blocks with lidocaine, bupivacaine, et cetera, um, lidocaine will, if it goes into the vein, so if it isn't just infused where you're trying to infuse it locally, if you accidentally infuse it into the vein, you need to be prepared to potentially deal with those consequences. Usually lidocaine toxicity causes tremor, face, mouth numbness. It can, in rare cases, at higher doses, which would be very hard to achieve in a case like this, cause seizures or bradycardia. I have once had a a poor PA student uh, pick up the lidocaine and flush the pick line with lidocaine. And so I've seen all of these uh, you know, effects happen, but they tend to be self-limited. You, you do need to watch your patient closely. They tend to be self-limited with lidocaine. Bupivacaine is different. I do like bupivacaine as a long-term nerve block agent, uh, but it has not as favorable safety profile as some other drugs like ropivacaine, and that's because of this QT prolongation. So bupivacaine uh, will lengthen your QT interval, and if you get too much of it into the vein and too much of it systemically, it will actually require or cause heart block. 
um, which is a very difficult heart block to get patients out of, um, especially if you don't identify that the injection of bupivacaine is what caused the heart block. There is, I do, I use bupivacaine not often for intra, uh, not often for these types of nerve blocks, but I use it often for nerve plexus blocks, et cetera. Um, I never inject bupivacaine without having some intralipid uh, in the room. Intralipid is what you use to reverse a bupivacaine heart block. It essentially is just intravenous uh, soluble fat. And as I understand it simply, bupivacaine is fat soluble. And so by injecting the intravenous soluble fat, you can bring bupivacaine out of solution and hopefully reverse that heart block quickly. Uh, ropivacaine is slightly shorter acting than bupivacaine, but is also slightly safer. You're more likely to end up with a neurologic side effects such as a seizure, less likely to end up with any type of heart issues with ropivacaine. And so there are a large number of practitioners who don't prefer to do nerve blocks with ropivacaine than bupivacaine, and I think that's perfectly fine. Um, something that some people do to mitigate all of this that I personally don't, but I actually think it's a pretty good idea, uh, is add a little bit of epinephrine to your mixture. If you add a little epi to your mixture and you accidentally inject it IV, you're going to cause tachycardia, and that tachycardia is going to be an early warning sign before you've injected uh, all the medication that you're going to use to do the nerve block. Um, sedation, just really quickly, uh, can you do these under local anesthesia? Uh, can you do simple nerve blocks under local anesthesia? You absolutely can. Um, can you do it under moderate sedation? Sure. Uh, you do need to be aware of your patient, though, especially the patients who uh, are going to be in pain prone while you're injecting them. Can you position these patients on their side instead of prone and make it a little bit easier for them? You can. Uh, I would say though that when I'm doing thermal ablations, uh, any type of neurolysis, I want to be really confident with uh, where my needle or my probe is uh, and I'm lucky to have a very good relationship with anesthesia so I'm usually pretty quick to call them and they'll send somebody to deliver some some propofol, some ketamine, get my patients deeper um, and give me a, more of a MAC anesthesia. Uh, I do this especially for uh, cryoneurolysis or for any type of ablation, and I'll show you why in a minute, but essentially I'm going to be coming posteriorly from a bit of a lateral to a medial angle, and I'm going to go possibly, I'm going to start close to the scapula and close and go through a decent amount of the latissimus dorsi, and any patient who's awake enough to move their arm a little bit, the moving of that muscle, moving of the scapula, you can very quickly drastically change the angle of the probe. And I think most of my residents have had the opportunity to see this uh, doing you know, prone lung biopsies at some point in time. Um, and it's, it's something that I, I like them to become aware of. And so for this reason also, when a patient's prone and has their arms up above their head, I really want them to be uh, more deeply sedated than the moderate sedation that, that I'm gonna offer. All right, let's finally talk a little bit about how we get this procedure done. Um, first of all, what are we going to select for imaging guidance? I need to put a needle right underneath the rib. There's so many different ways that we can do that. It's worth noting that this was done with some efficacy long before imaging came along. This image uh, is roughly 100 years old, and this is demonstrating you know, the available angles to, to target uh, the intercostal nerve and do it just with palpation. Uh, can this be done? Yes. Is it decrease the efficacy of the procedure? Probably decreases the success rate. Um, but in places where imaging is not available, it's not it's not unreasonable for practitioners to be attempting this. Uh, ultrasound is is pretty useful. Can you do this with ultrasound only? You probably could. It's nice to in real time be able to see exactly where you're placing your needle tip, exactly where you're placing your probe. Personally, I am going to want at least fluoro and possibly CT to really document where exactly that needle tip is, especially when I'm doing a more permanent uh, neurolysis. Uh, I want to document exact, the ultrasound won't, will document where the needle tip is relative to the rib. It doesn't do anything to document which rib level in the chest I'm actually targeting. Uh, certainly fluoro and CT can help more with that. Uh, but it's worth mentioning that if you're in a part of the country or in a facility anywhere in the world that doesn't have access to CAT scan, you don't need CAT scan to, to do these procedures. Um, 
let's talk about the techniques that are specifically employed here a little bit. There are a lot of different, uh, there are a lot of different um, techniques out there. There are a number of different papers, a lot of them coming from the IR world, a lot of them borrowed from pain management world. If you're just doing a pharmacologic block, you don't need a large needle. And the smaller needle you pick, uh, the less bleeding risk there's going to be. So personally, a 22 gauge needle is plenty large. A 25 gauge needle that I already have on the table from lidocaine, also probably large enough and in a lot of patients long enough to reach my target. Um, do you need to inject contrast to see where things are going? So this is something that I don't do commonly, uh, largely because I tend to do more ablations than I do pharmacologic uh, nerve blocks. However, you can inject a little bit of contrast under fluoro or very dilute contrast under the CAT scan to really see where that injection is going to go. This will demonstrate what level you're targeting, but it also is going to show you how the medication is going to spread out along the fascial planes. One complication that can certainly happen is non-target pharmacologic uh, and you know non-target uh, non-target damage by that pharmacologic agent you're using to do your neurolysis and if so if you're injecting alcohol if you're injecting phenol if you're injecting something that's going to cause a more permanent effect um, you that uh, medication can move from the intercostal nerve along the sheath and get into the paraspinal space and it can even get into the intrathecal space and so we want to make sure that doesn't happen especially when we're doing a more permanent block it's probably way less important when we're doing uh, doing temporary uh, temporary blocks, but if we're doing any type of permanent block, there's at least a theoretical risk uh, that we can cause uh, you know some permanent uh, injury, including paralysis, if we put too much medication in and it managed to spread all the way into the epidural space. Um, at least in some studies of volunteers, some studies of cadavers, it's pretty well demonstrated that that space can communicate with these uh, uh, these nerves. Um, again, I will always inject, I will aspirate frequently throughout my injection, at least every couple of milliliters to make sure that I'm not aspirating in blood and I'm not doing any type of uh, intravascular injection. Also make sure that I'm not aspirating any air and my needle advanced further than, than where I left it. Um, so let's talk specifically about what we might use to do a diagnostic or short-term block. Um, bupivacaine is probably the thing that I would use most frequently. Again, it does have kind of the less favorable safety profile, but it also works the longest. And if you're careful with your technique, careful with your injections, and you have some experience, I think it's perfectly safe to use. Three to five milliliters of 0.5% bupivacaine is more than enough to uh, to accomplish a good temporary 18 hour intercostal nerve block. Uh, I will use much more than this for nerve plexus blocks sometimes, and so the body can handle it so long as it all stays nice and local. Uh, one thing you can consider, and this is something that uh, I, I just learned about not that long ago, but I think the pain management people have known for a while, is adding 10 milligrams of triamcin alone. Uh, they're not really sure, I don't think, about the mechanism of action here, but it has been demonstrated that by adding a steroid, and this is the one that I've seen most frequently used, you can potentiate the duration of the action of that bupivacaine. And so this is something that's a little bit exciting to, to those of us who might do these blocks uh, with some frequency. Um, let's talk about the indication for neurolysis, though. So the indication for permanent intercostal nerve injury. Uh, we talked about the two medications. Uh, phenol has been used at least as much as alcohol and is pretty effective. Uh, injecting one milliliter of, so the, the phenol comes at 89% in most formulations that I've seen. The idea is that we want the final formulation, the final solution that we're injecting to be somewhere between seven and 10%. So there are lots of different uh, recipes that you can look up, but the idea here is that you're gonna put about one milliliter of phenol and a little bit of bupivacaine into a 10 milliliter solution and then inject about one to three milliliters and that should be sufficient to uh, do your neurolysis once you get the needle in the right spot. Uh, alcohol is a little bit different. So we, we want that dehydrate, uh, 
that dehydrated alcohol, 95% pure alcohol to stay that strength. And so injecting about two milliliters of alcohol and then flushing with one milliliter of 0.5% bupivacaine just to clear out your needle and get some bupivacaine in the area is the most common uh, thing that I have seen done for these types of nerve blocks. Um, again, just remember that this is going to spread along fascial planes, especially when you're doing pharmacologic neurolysis. It's for this reason that, you know, I do pharmacologic neurolysis in some nerve plexuses, um, but it's not my go-to for the intercostal nerve block. I do far prefer ablation. And it's not that ablation can't have, uh, you know, similar or worse uh, side effects. It could, but I know that my ice ball, uh, especially if I'm doing a cryoablation, is not going to spread all the way into the paraspinal space or spread all the way into the epidural space or into the spine. I can visualize that ice ball. That being said, you don't need a forty thousand dollar ablation machine to treat these patients. You can do this cheaply and effectively pharmacologically uh, where you don't have access to an ablation machine. So let's talk about ablation quickly. Um, well, let's talk about the ablations that I personally am not going to use. Radio frequency ablation has been around for a long time. Microwave ablation has been around for a little bit less. Uh, these are very effective ways to cook tissue quickly, rapidly. Uh, they're excellent for treating visceral tumors, uh, sometimes even peripheral tumors, and you can absolutely perform, cryo perform neurolysis with a ablation that cooks tissue. Um, all of us who have done microwave and RF ablations for lengths of time have accidentally caused a sensory neurolysis somewhere where we were not mindful of a nerve in the pelvis, um, wherever it may be, but this has been widely described. And so you can do, you know, you can have neural you can have neurolysis as a side effect of treating tumors. Um, these these techniques can be sometimes too effective um, or very effective in an unwanted setting at killing nerves. That being said, for the intercostal nerve block, I far prefer cryoablation. It has a couple of downfalls. It does take longer. It also takes these large tanks of gas to to get the procedure done. Um, but it has the benefit of forming this ice ball. And the ice ball, interestingly, is less dense and thus visible uh, on CT. So it's less dense to x-rays than surrounding water or soft tissue. Um, so we can actually see this ice ball form as we're, we're doing the treatment. Um, there also is just a sense that freezing tends to feel better on pain than heating does. And there's some uh, research uh, that backs this up. Uh, I don't know that a whole lot of that research was done in nerve blocks. I think most of it was done in visceral tumors and uh, MSK tumors, but cryoablation still is usually my go-to if I'm looking to decrease pain in a patient. Um, so let's talk about cryoneurolysis a little bit. Uh, I don't uh, want to talk too specifically about any of the companies or products that do this, but there are, at least in the U.S., two commercially available systems. And they both have some advantages and they both have some disadvantages. Um, I'm not here to advocate for one over the other. The basic idea behind these systems is that you are pumping very uh, compressed gas, uh, in this case argon, through these needles. And as the gas expands, it rapidly cools, in this case hypercools, this needle um, in order to create ice and draw energy from the tissue uh, surrounding the needle. Um, the argon tends to, it works very quickly, works very well. You can usually get things to start freezing within minutes. And then it's a matter of how long you leave the probe in there and how high you basically set the machines uh, as to how large your ice ball forms once you've selected your needle. So you can see here that there are different needles that from each company uh, create different size ice balls at 100%. Um, what's interesting and important to know about this, probably more so for tumor treatment, but also for what we're doing is that the overall visualized ice represents what we call the zero degree Celsius isotherm. So at zero degrees is where the ice forms. Everything inside of that is gonna be significantly colder. When we're talking about tumor ablation, it's that negative 20 degree isotherm that we consider to be the level that with some confidence, um, 
we think that we've killed that that tissue. And so I don't expect my kill zone to be as large as the ice ball. I expect it to be smaller. I expect it to be these smaller, medium-sized circles, um, you know, within. And the center of these, you know, the center of these uh, ice balls, the center of these needles are getting down to negative 100 degrees Celsius, which is, I'm from Wisconsin, that's still a cold day. Um, but the idea is that the ice ball, I know I'm not doing any damage outside of the ice ball. I also know that my damage is not going to extend all the way up to the edge of the ice ball, but it allows me to protect uh, tissues that I don't want to hurt. Um, I'm going to select in this case a probe from one of the companies that creates a relatively small ice ball, uh, something two to three centimeters, you know, ablation zone that's only two to three centimeters. Obviously, the ice ball is going to be a little bit larger than that. Um, I'm not using the largest probes that they have. One of the things with uh, cryoablation that's important to know is that we have to actually cycle the cryoablation machine in order to cause the cytotoxicity. So we don't just freeze it and then thaw it and then anticipate everything is going to die within. We actually freeze it for some period of time, let it thaw somewhat, and then freeze it again. And it's the cycling that is actually supposed to cause the cytotoxicity. When we're treating visceral tumors, the typical accepted way to do this is that you freeze for 10 minutes, you thaw for five to eight minutes. And when you're thawing, you can, different machines, different systems do different things. You can either pump another gas such as helium through in order to thaw the needle out. Uh, some of the needles have uh, basically electric heaters built in that allow them to thaw the needles as well as to thaw the tissue around. But we're gonna thaw for five to eight minutes and then we're gonna freeze again for 10 minutes and then we're gonna thaw again and then we're gonna consider this to be done. This is probably very much overkill for what we're trying to do with the nerve block. So for cryoneurolysis, what I do and some of the better written algorithms out there, what some of the out, many of the algorithms out there do similar uh, is to do a five minute freeze, a four minute thaw, and then a five minute freeze. It's worth mentioning there's some people who don't do anything close to that. There's some people who do a 90 second single freeze and call it a day and seem to have good outcomes. And so are we you know, wasting precious time? We might be, but uh, it still is half the amount of time that I, I do for a typical cryoablation. And so it's really not all that bad. Um, another thing to do, I, is set the power for the probes down. And I do this slightly differently with different systems out there, but I'm usually not using the probe, the cryo probe at full strength. I'm usually using it somewhere between 30 and 50%. Uh, I will then evaluate the size of the ice ball on CT as we're doing it and make sure that I'm liking what I'm seeing. Um, this is different than visceral tumor ablation where I'm almost always starting at 100% and then dialing back individual probes to, to kind of shape my ice ball. Usually one probe at 30 to 50% is all that we really need to do here. Uh, an interesting note, at least one rep has told me that the if you have one of these systems that has the integrated electric heater for thawing, not to use it. Um, I think the thinking is that they don't want to overly excite any of the tissue in the area. I'm honestly not quite so sure, but it doesn't really seem necessary. And so I, if I am using that system, I tend not to use the, uh, the electric heater. I just use passive thawing. All right, let's look here at a couple of cases, which are going to demonstrate this hopefully well. Um, these are both cryoneurolysis cases. Um, they are both patients who had pretty good uh, outcomes, and uh, they're both interesting cases. So the first patient is a 49-year-old uh, female who did not uh, did not actually have cancer. She had uh, desmoids, which are a benign. Uh, they're benign growth that can be locally very aggressive and can be very challenging to, te uh, to treat. They can recur. Um, but she had these uh, resected. There, you know, incidentally, are a lot of us that are pushing the ablation of these desmoids these days as a therapeutic alternative. But she had this uh, resected, and it was a fairly wide resection, and it happened about five years prior to, uh, to her presenting to us. What she had was basically what we talked about earlier, is basically this post-thoracotomy syndrome, except she's having it down in the abdominal wall. Um, and so if you look closely here, the uh, you can see the asymmetry in the abdominal wall, just at the lower ed end of the thorax here. You can see some of the scarring and soft tissue. And unfortunately, she did not come to me with, uh, with prior imaging. I only saw kind of the asymmetry in the soft tissue. 
And so this was really a clinical conversation. You know, she and I sat down and talked about where her pain was, uh, you know, where, where it was worse. And to me, it seemed to map out to right around T8. And so based on that dermatome, based on T8, we decided to target, uh, we decided to target her intercostal nerves. So I'm switching over here to PAC. So I want to make sure I have the correct case. I actually don't think I do. Hold on one more second. Yeah, so this is her. So, uh, and this is good. So I can walk you through each and every step. Um, so we started by taking a scout, identifying which uh, rib level that we were uh, most interested in. I always start my patients uh, out with a grid and then using that grid, uh, I always have my residents uh, put the lidocaine needle in first. Even if we're you know, going to end up doing the biopsy with something bigger, or we're going to do the uh, ablation with a larger probe, I always start with the lidocaine needle. It allows them to do it as a practice needle. It's very hard to damage anything with a lidocaine needle um, and allows us to make sure that we're entering the skin at the right site. We made our skin neck at the right site and to you know, iterate on top of this based on where we want to go in the skin and what angle we want to take. So this was where our lidocaine needle was, and then here is our cryoprobe coming in, and you can see right here we aimed kind of just right at this rib. We're a little bit actually going to be right underneath it, and we just made a few adjustments until we got it to right about here and then right about here. And what this is showing is our final uh, probe placement. It is lateral to the transverse process, and it could be even more lateral still, uh, but it's living right underneath uh, this rib. And if I window level this, you can see the probe living. It's not here on this slice. On this slice, you're seeing a little bit of rib, and you're seeing the probe, and essentially leave the probe immediately underneath the, the rib. You can also see this marker and this marker. These kind of demonstrate what the boundary of the ablation zone is going to be. Uh, on the very next frame here, we started to freeze, and you see a little bit of what could be hematoma, could be ice ball extending into uh, the lung, and this is fine. This is just going to cause a little bit of pleural scarring, doesn't usually uh, cause any discomfort in anybody. And what's really fun about this is looking at the laterals. So if we look at the laterals and we window this just a little bit more aggressively, you can start to see this hypodense area which is the ice ball. And so this is towards the end of our second uh, five minute freeze cycle. And we're creating this ice ball right here. It's a little bit posterior, but it's fairly well central, uh, centered on, um, you know, centered on the posterior aspect of this rib right where the nerve lives. Come back to this quickly. One of the things that I like to do is come in at a little bit of an angle here from lateral to medial. I'll do this even more in the next case, but I don't come straight down. And the idea is to not uh, pick up, not put the pleura at quite so much risk and also get the rib and the needle just a little bit more parallel to each other. All these ablation, uh, all these ablation probes, whether it's microwave, RF, cryo, whatever it is, they all, you know, all the manufacturers try to tell you that they're gonna give you the most spherical ablation zone possible. But the reality is that the ablation zone always is longer along the long axis of the needle than it is wide. And so we want to take advantage of that a little bit and have it the long axis of the ablation zone cross the long axis of the nerve just a little bit better. So this was the first uh, this was the first ablation for this patient and then my resident would have walked the next needle down into position and we did the next cryo zone here. Here's a really good example of this ice ball. And here it's really nicely centered. Is it a little bit anterior and pushing on the pleura? It probably is, but we're we're in a position where we're confident managing that pneumothorax if we have to, and we did not get one in this case. Um, so we did those two levels and then we did the third level and we called it a day. So this was a three level, uh, a three level case. Uh, she did well. I can talk about the outcomes of both of them in just a minute. This is what you guys have already seen. Let me get, let me cut through to the second case because I don't want to keep you, anybody here too long. Uh, the second case is an interesting one. 59-year-old patient, 18 months prior to coming to me, uh, had a resection of a premanubrial liposarcoma. So seeing anterior in the chest. This unfortunate uh, man had a liposarcoma grow, and he had it resected, but it continued to 
it was not completely resected, it tended to grow back and quickly develop metastatic lesions of the lung. And then it started to erode into the fourth rib. And what was surprising about this guy is that he really wasn't, he really was highly functioning. He, I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, so this was back before he had the resection. He was had this biopsy proven, you know, spiculated, looks ugly, looks undifferentiated, undifferentiated liposarcoma, sitting right in front of the manubrium here. And then within a couple of months, so jumping forward a couple of months here, patient's uh, soft tissue mass had unfortunately gotten significantly larger, but now we're also starting to see that uh, there are going to be some lung mats. And they start off small, not terribly large, but 10 months later, which is both a long time and not very long in, in, in this for this poor patient, came back and you can just see from the chest x-ray, the patient has a large space occupying lesion in the upper left lung. Um, if we look at those lung windows, let's look at this one. Nope, let's look at this one. You can see this large space occupying lesion here, um, but you can also see there's a smaller lesion down here and there's a smaller lesion down here. These are both fairly large. If we go to the soft tissue windows, what we're gonna see is that this lesion here has basically, here's the normal third rib. This fourth rib has been completely destroyed for this length. And this lesion right here was starting to cause this patient a lot of pain. Now, I said this patient was highly functioning. He walked in to the office. He had a uh, you know, pretty high quality and uh, you know, pretty high quality of life. But he's starting to feel more pain and was starting to increase his uh, pain regimen. And he was looking, uh, he was looking to hopefully uh, mitigate this pain. And so we did what we did with our other patients, I again performed, and this would be a good example of where I probably, possibly could have gotten away with just one level. Um, here's the destroyed fourth rib. The other ribs look fine, rib right below and above it. So I did start by targeting this uh, fourth rib. And so here we have the lidocaine needle. Here you can see we're coming really close, now that we're higher up, coming really close to the scapula with the lidocaine needle, planning our approach. Um, here we come, and this is one of my enterprising residents who got this into position right underneath the remnant of the fourth rib. I can even zoom that in just a little bit. Um, and I can do a bone window to kind of show you again, different system, slightly different needle. These two markers kind of show where the ablation zone is gonna show up. And we're seeing right underneath uh, this fourth rib and nice and lateral to the Spinous process, but not too far lateral because the destruction is already happening here, and there are going to be little branches that are going to give out uh, little cutaneous, little short branches that are going to innervate this chest wall. And so we did an ablation at this level, and I think I did a poor or a non-existent job of showing the ice balls in this case. Um, we just got the needle into the right position, did our freezing, thawing, freezing regimen, and called it a day. Um, and at the end here, you're going to see, you know, essentially no hematoma, no pneumothorax. I guess I can prove that to you, prove it to myself. I don't think there's a pneumothorax. There's not. And uh, both these patients did well. So going back to presentation here quickly. Um, both these patients anecdotally had marked uh, improvement in pain and significantly decreased uh, opiate requirements. The first lady who had the kind of the post thoracotomy syndrome thing going on, but with the abdominal wall, she was in an incredible amount of pain. Um, she really was having major depression. Her, she had been on disability for years. She had a very high opiate requirement. And a month or two later, I don't think she came off disability, but her opiate requirements had significantly decreased. And subjectively, she reported that her pain had much improved. Six months later, she did say that her pain got worse. And so we retargeted T9 and extended more inferiorly, uh, repeated the cryoablation at slightly different levels um, based on what she was telling us. The other patient, the palliative pain sarcoma patient, uh, he did have marked pain improvement. He managed to get back off of opiates, and I was proud to say that he had, you know, a good quality of life for a while it lasted, which was only nine months uh, longer. But, um, you know, the idea that somebody could come in, have a single one-day, couple-hour procedure, 
leave the same day, not have any major surgical repercussions, um, and increase uh, you know increase their uh, their quality of life is what's so attractive about these procedures. Moving beyond the anecdotes, though, what can we actually tell patients in terms of studies? And I, I, I'm not going through every study that's out there. Frankly, there aren't that many that are more than small cohort studies. Nobody's really done good randomized control trials that I'm aware of. But the good takeaway, and what I can usually tell my patients with some confidence and hope to do better, is that at least 70% of patients are going to see major or miraculous improvement in their pain. And a smaller percentage of patients will see no improvement or just mild improvement in their pain, much less than what they expected. And so that 70% number is kind of what I quote uh, most patients. I do like to think that as we're using more modern techniques and as we more carefully select patients and as we're able to visualize everything so much better than the decades before where a lot of this research comes from, uh, we can actually improve on that 70% a lot. Um, I, th I think I've taken more of your time uh, than I had intended. So I, again, appreciate uh, all of this. I always enjoy any ability to reach out to, to future interventionalists. It doesn't seem like all that long ago I was a future interventionalist myself. And uh, yeah, best of luck. If there are any uh, questions from the moderators or questions from, from chat, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks very much. Uh, does anyone have questions here? from the audience? It's usually not frequent, but I, I, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has one. Not seeing any questions so far. All right. Anything on All your right. guys' minds? Otherwise, we can call it. And then it, I'll just say I appreciate the opportunity to be here. No, this is a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks very right. much. Absolutely. Y'all take care. All right. Later. <laughs> All right. See you. All right. Bye.